Go ahead. It, yeah, but by the way, I you know, in your email, there seemed to be a, an urgency about some personal issues. If, oh, you want to, if you want to talk about that afterwards, be glad to do that. No, we do it all right on air okay. because it's relatable for everybody. And okay. we're at a stage now... Uh, my partner Lisa and I are all, we're we're turning fifty eight in a couple uh, months, and boy, through our families and our friends and everything, this is a conversation. And I don't think of any of us as particularly dumb people. I think we're rather smart, but we do not know what we're talking about in this regard. So that's why I am okay, great. so delighted to have sure. you on the show, and I have a really good intro for you. Okay. So bear with me there, and I want I to will. say. Welcome to Over 50, Starting Over, everyone. I'm Barry Edwards, and today I'm here with Stan Goldberg. Dr. Stan Goldberg, and I want to ask you something before I give the intro. I have heard you say, you're so humble about the doctor thing. I heard you say, I'm not the kind of doctor that helps people. So I'm, I have to ask, <laughs> is this an academia title no, versus clinician or what? No, no, I, I have a doctorate in speech language pathology from the University of Pittsburgh. But the way that story came about, um, when I was in college, I often changed what I majored in. Oh, and my, mo so my, mother, my mother was a first generation American and she had a limited education and she had difficulty sometimes understanding what I was doing. So when I, when I was in uh, political. Well, actually, at first I was I was got a, my degree in philosophy, and she couldn't do anything with that. Did not understand that. I totally then, got you. Th th then I went into political theory, and she knew that has something to do with politics, but she didn't quite know what that was. But the the stunner was when I became a speech language pathologist, and mm -hmm. I heard her explaining or trying to explain to one of her friends what I was doing, and she said, "Well, you know." He does things with children's tongues, and he he's a doctor, but not the type that helps people. Uh, that's so where that came from. So it's been my favorite line, but I, I always prefer to be called Stan rather than doctor. Well, that's very humble of you. A lot of people have, and I totally get this, do not fault anybody. A lot of people are like, I worked really hard for that title, so I'm going to use it. You yeah, know? well, I, I worked hard for the title, but that's not what makes you distinguished. Well, that's very true. I don't even think that you put it uh, on your books. You just uh, you author Stan Goldberg, correct? Uh, there, I'm just looking at the book right now on the spine. It doesn't say PhD on the cover. It does say PhD, and that, those are decisions that the publisher makes, not me. Ah, I see. Gotcha. Okay. Hey, how about we do the intro? Sounds All good. Right. Okay. Okay. I worked hard on this. So let me get to it. Here. <laughs> okay. Okay. And boy, there's my next question. Stan is a person living with cancer. Uh, he's a also professor emeritus. I have, always have, I always mispronounce it. Professor emeritus in communicative disorders at San Francisco State University. He has provided therapy, research, and published in areas of learning problems, communication disorders, loss, change, and end-of-life issues for more than 25 years. For eight years, Stan was a bedside hospice volunteer and currently counsels caregivers. Wow. Stan offers workshops throughout the world on change, loss, and end-of-life issues. He also consults with individuals and corporations on issues of personal and orga organizational change. Uh, his published articles range from humor of being forced to ride an angry horse. I, I didn't edit that part. <laughs> I took this <laughs> off of your bio and I was going to edit that part because I, I was stumbling over it. Uh, to profoundly spirit, spiritual, to profound spirituality, enhanced holding. Oh, oh, his profound spirituality was enhanced holding someone as they died, which I can only imagine. Your background is amazing. Uh, he says my blog, radio, and TV interviews and downloadable art, uh, articles uh, and his complete resume can be found at stangoldbergwriter.com. I will have that in the show notes. And he says, feel free to contact him for media interviews, presentations, workshops, coaching, and consultation at, and do you want me to really give away your personal email address? Sure. Really, you are brave. Yeah. All right. Stan at stangoldbergwriter.com. 
I also have the link to his book uh, on Amazon here. And you have several other books as well. And they're very interesting. You know what? I'm going to share the screen right here because I am on your website and I like this page. I found it very interesting. So you have... Uh, you're you're featuring preventing senior moments right now. That's largely what we're going to talk about. But boy, you have had a heavy, heavy life. So you got uh, loving, supporting, and caring for the cancer patient, and uh, learning, uh, leaning into sharp points, a practical guidance and nurturing support for caregivers. I think that's a very uh, interesting and important one. I like this one. This one really jumps out to me. Lessons for the living. Stories of forgiveness, gratitude, and courage at the end of life. I have to tell you, forgiveness and gratitude uh, is something that we talk about a lot on this podcast. I think they're heavier concepts than you may think uh, at the surface. So I find that one very uh, interesting. And then we have, I have cancer. 48 things to do when you hear those words. That one, wow. Stan, I want to... Um, kind of talk about that for a minute, because I don't, I haven't heard you elaborate on this outside of saying that you've been dealing with cancer for 25 years. Do I, please divulge what you would like. I, I find that to be profound, because if you're really faced with something like that, um, on a very realistic basis, I think that gives you a whole different perspective on life and reality. It does. Um I would have to go back to when I was told I had cancer, uh, this I prostate cancer, and this was about 25 years ago. And uh, I was informed through a phone call uh, by and my uh, urologist at that time. And it was one of those things, just like when Kennedy was assassinated, everybody knew where they were and what they were yeah, doing, at least sure. in my generation. Uh, it's the same way I find when you are informed that you have an illness or a disease that has the potential for taking your life. So I knew, I remember exactly what I was eating, where I was sitting, mm -hmm. what the words were, and my reaction. Uh, and that essentially began a, a lifelong journey that changed my life. Right uh, at that point, at that point, I had been a university professor for many years. And like many academicians, my life was pretty much steeped in being analytical and being objective and, and being unemotional, especially with, with some things. Mm. Well, that changes overnight when all of a sudden you see that, you know, well, I was diagnosed with a form that was very aggressive. Uh, I don't know really? if, if you remember Frank Zappa, but yeah. Frank Zappa died from prostate cancer. And he, there's a scale called the Gleason scale goes one to nine. He had a nine. I had a seven. So hmm. I knew that there was always potential there for dying. And uh, when they, they did the procedure, everything appeared to be okay, except the cancer cells basically had escaped from the prostate. And I wow. knew at that point that I would always be living with, with cancer. So when people say you're a cancer survivor, I say, no, there's very rarely anything like that. We are people who are living with detectable or undetectable cancer. Mm. So that, that, was, that was the impetus for changing. And through a series of very bizarre circumstances, uh, I got invited to a party that a friend gave where one of her friends was the partner of someone who was dying at Laguna Honda, which is the uh, indigent hospital in San Francisco. And I went there basically to come up with communicative ideas for the staff because he also had had a stroke. Mm -hmm. And um, I was so blown away by what I saw. I knew that uh, at a real at a gut level, I had to be involved in hospice. And that began eight years of, of my hospice work um, where uh, I was involved in uh, in the lives and the deaths of patients and their caregivers. So I only stopped doing that when because of a, uh, a lifelong sleep disorder, I couldn't focus as much as I needed to uh, on being present for my patients. Mm. So that, that's basically the, the short version. 
Yeah, well, I, I would say that would be profoundly life changing in and of itself, uh, dealing with people that are dying in their families that are dealing with loved ones dying. And I, I agree, but in, in a way that people don't understand. OK, Let's hear most it. most people think about when I tell them that I was a hospice worker, a hospice volunteer, the first thought is that was that's a wonderful thing, a selfless thing that you're doing. Mm hmm. Uh, almost as if I was a Mother Teresa. Ah, uh, okay. What they don't understand was every day that I walked away from the bedside, I thanked that patient for allowing me to be with him or her. Because there is, a, there is an honesty that happens at the bedside of anyone who is dying that you will never experience in any relationship you ever have. Wow. And it's through that honesty you know, the willingness to share things about their life that they maybe never talk to anybody that you gain a new perspective on your own life. And wow. initially I was just, I, I was working on another book at that time. And I thought, well, th these are incredible things. I'm just going to write them down and just put them aside. And I realized very shortly that this was going to be the basis of a book. And it was going to be mm. my memoir about being a hospice volunteer and that that's where leading into sharp points came. Wow. I'm, not, I'm sorry. No, I take that back. Lessons for the living. Oh, OK. And that's the yeah. one I found uh, extremely right. interesting. Yeah. I um, what you said about how profound it is that people are at their most honest at that moment. I had never given thought to. But mm -hmm. you know what? There's a, <laughs> the reason you're here. There's a lot of things I hadn't given thought to when I all of a sudden woke up at 40, uh, 57 years old. I. <laughs> Shockingly, just found myself here in uh, all of our, you know, I, I, that makes me think of something an old friend of mine said to me a couple years ago. Uh, he was uh, my old high school buddy, and he's and uh, our wrestling coach passed away. He he messaged me. He's like, "Hey, would you like to go to the funeral? I'll meet you there." Like, yeah, we're walking in. He goes, "You know, some years ago I, I used to only see you at weddings. Now I only see you at funerals. It's like." Mm -hmm. the perspective of how quickly yeah. our lives yeah. transpire yeah. like that. It just all of a sudden we wake up and we're here. So all of a sudden I wake up and my friends and family were all talking about when uh, do you see a decline in a parent and what do we do about it and what are the steps? And so the first thing I wanted to ask you and wanted to discuss with you is uh, I bet you most of us don't know the difference between Alzheimer's and dementia. Could you explain that a bit, please? Yeah. Actually, Alzheimer's is just one form of dementia. With dementia, there is uh, lots of changes that go on with, with processing. The, the easiest and simplest way, and I, and I think my neurologist friends would, would cringe when I explain it this way, is think about um, what happens when an individual perceives the world, okay? Specifically in terms of memory. Well, there's certain steps in, in learning something and forming a memory. The first one is attention. You have to be able to attend to something before you learn it, before you apply it. Once you understand it, that's a separate step in memory. If you understand it, then you have to store it. And it's stored Either, there's a thing called, it's like a very temporary storage. So if I see a strange person walking in front of me, even though they're gone, I will still retain that memory. But that then moves to short-term memory and then from short-term to long-term. So that, that's the, the, the four different stages of, of, of memory. Actually, there's a fifth one called sequential memory. Mm -hmm. And that is, example would be, I'm down in my office. I want to go upstairs to, in, in the kitchen and, and get a cup of coffee. By the time I'm up there, I forgot why I'm there. So that's an example of sequential. We all, we all do that, I know. Yeah. So the so that happens in everybody, mm -hmm. whether you you have any form of dementia or you're just getting older. But yeah. with oh. different I'm sorry. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah I yeah. just think this is important to recap, but four to five stages of storing a memory. And I mm -hmm. think it was like perception. 
understanding. You have to understand what you're perceiving. Right. And then, okay, you got to help me because I don't yeah, remember. Yeah, I think it, these are important, though. Okay. You have to retrieve that memory, and then you have to use it. So, oh. it, so you can you can find problems in in the book that I wrote about preventing senior moments. I give examples of each of those. Mm -hmm. But when you have someone that has forms of dementia, yeah, they might have deficits in any of those steps. But what differentiates them from people who are, let's say, just getting older, is something called executive memory or executive functioning. Mm -hmm. Give you an example. I decide that I want to make scrambled eggs this morning. Okay, well, I'm looking around. I think, okay, where did I put the eggs? Well, I know that they should be in the refrigerator, and but they're over here because I bought some this morning and I need to get a pot and a pan and, and I'm thinking all of these. Now, and, you know, I may forget where I put the eggs. That doesn't mean I have dementia. But I will become suspect if I forget how to make those eggs. Mm. I've made them for 25 years. And oh. now I need to put together all of these memories, executive functioning. When that starts to happen, then we, you know, we really suspect that dementia is occurring. I'll give you a real life example of that. I have a friend of mine uh, with early onset Alzheimer's in Great Britain. And he was telling me that once he was walking across the street, and he had to step up on the curb, you know, to get on the sidewalk. And he forgot how to do that. Wow. Something. And it's a, it was the most frightening experience he ever had to that time. And essentially, that's an example of executive functioning. We, we do that constantly. All day long, we do executive functioning. Mm -hmm. And if you start seeing problems like that, that's a, more of an indication that someone is, is having dementia problems than let's say forgetting where they put their keys. Mm -hmm. Now, what I found interesting about that story is I virtually in my pretty ignorant experience, but I've never heard of someone putting it like that where they're uh, self-aware that they uh, had had an early onset Alzheimer's moment. It always seems to me that they're not aware of it, but the people close to them start questioning. Well, I, well, I think what happens is people who... It's not a you're you're normal and then you have dementia. It never happens that way. It really is is a process, and I think depending upon where in the development of the dementia the issue occurs will determine how aware the person is of it. Okay, so let's go real world here because this is what's going on in my family and amongst my friends. Uh, and I should say, by the way, I want to mention that. A uh, dear friend of mine, just a, a few months ago, about three months ago, uh, put his mother into assisted living uh, as she was uh, she was diagnosed in, he said there's seven stages, he was told there's seven stages of Alzheimer's. I believe she was diagnosed at five or six. Or when mm -hmm. she was diagnosed, she was that far along. And he said, uh, and this is like where my all of my knowledge came from. Um, he said that he, as he he was told, it's a very rapid progression in that disease, and he was worried, like many of us, many of us, worried about when do you start talking about assisted living with that loved one who's been living alone for so long, and they are, as a lot of us know, a lot of these people are going to go kicking and screaming to assisted mm -hmm. living. And you can understand why it's like, Oh, my God, this is my last stop. And uh, I'm going to be living in a prison for the, my final days. That's what's going on through their heads, I would imagine. In his case, he said it wasn't that hard, because she would come in and out of knowing what was being done. Yeah. And so there's that experience. Now with the rest of us, we're questioning if there is, if there are signs of early Alzheimer's because of very typically, and it's happening to me already on the podcast in the last year or so, is I forget words. Com really, sometimes mm -hmm. really common words. It's like, what is that word? You know, it kind of means this. Well, that's been happening with my mother. And as she admits, 
and her sister uh, a lot. And she okay. jokes about it. She's like a conversation on the phone between us is like a whole lot of pauses and silence. And um, okay. so there's that. And then there's other uh, instances of a person that will repeat themselves in a phone call more mm -hmm. often, more and more often. What should we take away from these? Okay, L lots of parts to the question. Yeah, let's 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 first start with um, about placing a loved one in a facility. Mm -hmm. Now, I wrote an article. It's on my website. I don't remember the name of it, but it was probably something like, "You're putting me where." Essentially, uh, looking at the dynamics of placing someone in a care facility. My recommendation, and one that my relatives did not follow, was investigate facilities long before your loved one needs it. And you want to do that for a couple of reasons. One is it takes a while to do it. The second, some of the times the waiting list to get into a quality facility is years. Mm. So you want to start that right away. And you don't necessarily want to do that uh, in secret. Involve the loved one. Explain to him what, what your concerns are. Not now. You know, he's saying yeah, your, your mind is as sharp as mine right now. But let's think about the worst. What if? What if? Mm. And that's one way of engaging in that. So that, that's the first part of that. Do it before, you know, before the person needs it. That's and you got to do it in a non-threatening way. You're not trying to get rid of them. Your concern is with their health. And you feel you may not be in a position to care for them as well as, as should be done. Mm -hmm. So that, that's the, the first part of it. So let's look at when do you know it's time to put someone in a facility? Well, one of the things that you don't do is you don't rely on a single situation or a single case. Sure. It's something, you know, if you think about when you go to a physician's office and he has to make a diagnosis based on certain behaviors rather than, let's say, blood samples, he will do that based on maybe a 15-minute interview he has with you. He says, ah, mm. based on this interview, you don't need to worry about this or you do need to worry about this. The problem in looking at dementia or looking at whether it's just um, a senior moment is you need to think of three things. Very simple. You need to think about the severity of what you just saw, the situation, and the number of times it occurred. Mm, sure. Back to a real world example. Man's going to uh, his favorite restaurant which is only six blocks from his house. He's been going there for 30 years. He's now going to do a pickup for dinner and he gets lost on the way. Well, you just look at that and you go, wow, he's disoriented. Disorientation is, is a big thing in, in dementia. And you, based on that, you're becoming real concerned. Mm. But what you don't know or you didn't realize is he's wearing a new pair of glasses, you know, which, which adjusts his vision. He just had an argument with his daughter about what she was doing. The boss is threatening to fire him and he hasn't slept well for three days. Mm. Okay. Okay. That makes real good sense right there. You go, right. the situation is, is different. Mm. You want to look at, at the severity of it. My wife loses her glasses a minimum of 10 times a day. And whenever we have a discussion, you know, I always say, see what they decided to hide in your, in your coat pocket. Okay. Yeah. So we find that that's not, a, you know, it's her inattention. Remember goes those, those four areas mm -hmm. of memory. So yeah. she forgot. So she, she was inattentive where she put them. Mm -hmm. But what happens if the person with glass, if she started putting the glasses in the refrigerator? Uh, That's very different. Mm -hmm. that, that, that would, you know, to me, that, that would be very concerned about that. Back to the man who got lost going to the restaurant. He not only did it once, but he's been doing it every week for the past month. So when you look at these things, the severity, the circumstances, and, and the, uh, the number of times, you get a much better idea. So when, when someone asks me, how can I tell if my wife is, 
you know, is beginning stages of Alzheimer's. I always say to them, start taking a diary hmm. uh, of, you know, and do it for a week, one hmm. week, you know, hmm. not a big deal of those things that you consider to be indications of dementia. And not only take a diary, but what's happening around that. Yeah. So you're, you are going to get a significantly better picture of your mother's cognitive ability than the neurologist who spends 15 minutes with her in an exam. Okay. How about, I'm backing up and going into specifics, we'll do one at a time. How about the person that is now repeating that story about what they did the day okay. before yeah. in the same conversation? Okay, that, that's, that's one of the things that, that I would call a senior moment. Question is, I, I was going to ask you to define that because that sounds yeah. loosey goosey, you know. It, it, it is loosey goosey, and and that's the problem. Uh, when right. when you when you when you read definitions or you read about senior moments in most of the literature, what is it defined as? Something that occurs people over fifty. It's humorous, and it indicates declining cognition. None of those are true. You know, there, there's no starting point for when a senior moment occurs. Um, it is rarely funny, and it's an indication not of dementia necessarily, but of a problem in processing information. Okay. That's the key thing. Mm -hmm. It's a problem that is solvable in how we process information. And again, I, I I hate to sound like like a commercial going back to the book, but in the in the book, I, I have ten strategies that people can use in order to prevent senior moments from occurring. Hey, can you give us a couple key points? Uh, yeah, um, I, I'll I'll just read them off real quickly so people okay. can get an idea, and then we can go back to these. Sure. Uh, one is to slow down. If if you think about about your ability to do something and the functioning of the brain. It's easy to think about it as two gears that need to mesh perfectly. You have an idea, something you want to do. You actually trying to implement either by words or action. So all of these gears got to go absolutely perfectly. Now, what happens though, if one of those gears is slightly off, okay, mm -hmm. the teeth are going to hit. I used to do stuttering therapy for, I did for, for 20 years. And one of the things that we realized is neurologically what was happening was that the brain was processing at a slightly faster speed than the brain could initiate the actual movements. So you had problems in speech. The minute we slowed down the person's speech, they were totally fluent. Now, that doesn't mean you can walk around all day with, with sounding, you know, like, like someone who couldn't speak the language, but it gave us some insights into, into looking at, at what happens neurologically that we can, we can depend upon to change a behavior. So that's one thing you just slow down. Yeah. You know, uh, if, if you're used to, to building a birdhouse in an hour in your, you know, with your, with your power saws and your wife is afraid you're going to chop off your fingers, mm. slow it down. Very mm -hmm. simply, you know, so no, that, that's totally one agree. example. Yeah. Uh, the second is, is, is combating inertia. You know, we don't like to change. We just don't. Right. So there's ways in which you can facilitate change. The third, and, and to me, one of the most fascinating things that people really don't talk about is the use of patterns. You know, when, when, we, when we learn something, what we think about is that we just learn one thing. We learn how to do this. We learn how to do that. But actually... What the brain is doing, the brain creates memories. And these memories are not single points, but rather there's a whole sequence, there's a pattern, much like, like dominoes, where you have a long line of dominoes, you knock one and it keeps hitting the others. There, there was a great story that I read, and I don't know whether it was an interview or it was in an article about Steph Curry and about this amazing ability he has to shoot baskets from midcourt. Mm -hmm. Well, his trainer said before every game, he shoots a minimum of 500 shots. Oh, my God. Okay, okay that'd be what, exhausting. But what does that do? Essentially, every time he shoots it and gets it correct, it lays down a new layer of memory. Mm -hmm. And that just keeps building up and up. So when, when he goes to a certain spot, he doesn't have to think. 
because right. it's this whole triggering mechanism. Mm -hmm. uh, and so that, that, that's, that's the, the, that part of it, the, uh, the using patterns. Our senior moments are often based on the triggering of that pattern. You know, uh, let's say go, going back to the example you gave, repeating a story four mm -hmm. times, you know, d during the, the same evening. Well, what triggered that? Is it because people turned their heads away from, from the person who was speaking and did, didn't give him the recognition or the attention he wants? Oh, What's happening? What's happening point. there? Yeah. So, so you, you want to do that. The other thing is uh, to challenge your brain. Most people think of the brain as this, this passive thing, you know, like a computer and, and it does this and that. We really don't understand it. But you actually can grow new neurons in your brain and the way that you do that I me mean, i found it just fascinating that they, they found this out with uh with people with alzheimer's and that by doing certain kinds of puzzles uh mm -hmm. doing cognitive things they were able to grow new neurons the characteristics involved in in cognitive behaviors were identical to those that were hypothesized by two researchers in, in the, I think it was about 2013, where what they looked at was they were trying to teach, to teach, to teach teachers to teach creativity to the students. Mm -hmm. And they wanted to know what skills were necessary. And they, they came up, and I'm just going to read this quickly. They came up sure. with, with six skills that they said, okay, if, if kids knew these, they're going to be creative. Mm -hmm. So they had them the ability to provide multiple answers to it with the information, constantly analyzing what's happening, a willingness to redraft and start over, the ability to engage in complex and creative problem solving activities, the ability to combine convergent and diversion thinking, and the willingness to ask what if questions. So these were six abilities that they said these are important in being creative. But guess what? Those are identical abilities that are required for cognitive activities. So how does this all relate to what we're talking about? If you are having, or even if I would say if you're having uh, senior moments, or even if you're not having senior moments, you want to exercise that brain. And you can do it by, by engaging in activities that require these skills that are identical for creative as well as for cognitive activities. Now I think about it, one of the, the, the activities that I do, I, I do a lot of sculpting, whether it's in stone or in wood. Nice. And, I can, and I compare what I do in, in order to complete something or even just do a daily activity with what's necessary for cooking a pot roast mm. creatively. Yeah. And they're, they're the same. So, Agreed. You know, so if, if you want to give your mother an incredibly wonderful gift for Christmas or Hanukkah, Mm -hmm. give her a crossword puzzle oh, sure. rather r rather than that silly sweater you've been thinking yeah. about. <laughs> you know, of course, I've always heard, and I love the word puzzles that are kind of crossword mm -hmm. puzzles on your phone. Yeah. I love those. I just think they're very fun. And mm -hmm. I like to do them early in the morning. I heard that that's an excellent way to exercise your brain. Oh, absolutely. See, the, the thing about, about these six abilities is that they don't depend upon the product of what you're doing. You know, when I'm out there, I could be making the ugliest wood sculpture in the world, mm -hmm. but I'm still using those skills for my brain. And that's the critical port point. And it's interesting, you mentioned doing it first thing in the morning. Yeah. Absolutely. And, you know, I, you know, maybe the next book I'm writing will, will be looking at at what's involved in having a, a healthy aging process. And one of the things is to have a routine in the morning. And that's one of the, that's one of the things that I do. When I wake up in the morning, I take the dogs out, I make myself a cup of coffee, I listen to music and I do something cognitive. Then I'm ready to start my day. That's so so you're, do, yeah. you're, you're right there. You're exactly awesome. where you should be. I got to ask you, what kind of dogs do you have? I, well, I have two. I have an English Springer Spaniel and a, a French bulldog. Oh, nice. Nice combination. Yeah. Uh, and how old are they? Uh, the spaniel, I think, is about 14. Oh. The bulldog is two. 
Oh, okay. Well, so you're doing the thing, uh, the overlapping. You want to be prepared when you lose the one, which is the hardest thing in the world. Yes, yeah, we, yeah. we've done it many times. Yeah, same here. It's nothing harder, but in fact, most of my family, my mother and my brother, they they will not get another dog because mm -hmm. of the pain. And mm -hmm. I, I just, I still, they're worth it. it I mean, it, as hard as it is to lose one of them, that unconditional love, it's worth those 14, 15 years that they give you. And, you know, it, it's interesting because that not only applies to dogs, it applies to people and applies to activities. Yeah. Uh, the whole notion of, of not doing something because you're afraid of the pain mm. deprives you of an incredible amount of wonderful things you could have experienced because of that. And the people what, that I've met because of walking my dog amongst the other people walking mm -hmm. their dogs at the park. Wonderful yeah. people. Yeah. yeah. Well, that's all on the side. So we were looking at, I believe there is 10 steps of things that you could do to help prevent uh, memory loss, Alzheimer's. Mm -hmm. eight. Actually, eight. Right. Eight. Okay. Yeah. So I, I'm not sure where you were on that list. <laughs> okay. We I think, yeah, we, we just, we went through challenging the brain. Okay. The next was, was making it lasting. L let's go back to the example uh, of someone forgetting their keys, their glasses, or something like that. For a, quite a while, before I, I came to understand what was going on, I would routinely either forget my keys, my wallet, or my cell phone uh, when I left the house. And, and I kept thinking, well, I've got to try to remember these things. Well, that's not how the brain works. The brain doesn't want to say, okay, let me depend upon something that I no longer can see to remind me of something I can no longer do. The brain says, no. You, you put that memory out there and make it lasting. So what I did was I did a number of things. First thing, uh, I took a number three and I posted it on the door before I left. So it, it, it was immediate, it was concrete, and I knew I needed to have three things in my pocket. The second thing was I would have a specific place for each item in my pocket. So even if I missed that three, you know, I routinely would have to, you know, I would touch my pocket. Oh, here it is. Here, okay. I think and that was important. fine. So that that's make it lasting. Uh, the, the sixth is to maintain focus. Remember we said before that there, there are the, the, the different steps in memory. And the first was mm -hmm. attention. Mm -hmm. So what you want to do, especially as you're getting older, you want to be able to enhance that attending ability. And you can do it through focusing. There's different ways of focusing. You do meditation uh, by, you know, by doing things linearly. In other words, you, you stop doing multitasking. Mm, yes. uh, you, you do things that will focus your mind on what you're doing. That's, that, that helps. Uh, the seventh is to manage your environment. You'd be amazed the number of things that can occur in your environment, which uh, is that which it's a conspiratory to make your life difficult. What do you, you mean? Know, well, as we get older, it's important that we simplify. You know, too many things are going on that that make it difficult to to carry things out. So, like right now, I'm sitting here in my office and I purposely have the background blurred. That's not because I want to highlight myself, because my office is now a mess. <laughs> and what happens is, you know, if I'm looking around the office rather than looking at you, that's going to affect my ability to mm. focus. It's going to affect yeah. everything. So what we want to do is we want to think about that. Um, when when I, I have a, a routine with with pills, that so the certain pills I need to take in the morning, uh, we have a, 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 a weekend place that we go to a cabin. And if I don't have the same pill box there that I have here, I will often forget to take them. Oh. So, so you, you want to have some similarity between different settings that you're in. And there, there's a whole bunch of these things. Again, they're in the book. Uh, but basically, you want to think about what is going to help you remember things, to focus, to be calm. And then once you can identify those, figure out what's interfering with that. Mm. So that that's, you know, the, the managing the environment. And the, the, the last one, which I find to be one of the most important, is the whole notion of practicing 
something different than a senior moment. So, okay, that 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 sounds weird. I know. Yes. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Uh, let Let's give you an example. Um, I was working with a gentleman who um would always repeat things in conversations, not necessarily to the extent that you you had mentioned, mm -hmm. but he would repeat things. Okay, so what I wanted to work out with him was the practice saying things once, okay? Uh, and it, to do that within a social setting, to do that, you know, wherever it was occurring. Mm -hmm. And so we devised a little thing where um, if he told a story, he would make a little check mark, you know, in a, in a tab. And he knew he said that story once. Okay. So he practiced using that. You know, it, did the stories disappear? Not necessarily. You know, they were still there. But instead of saying them six times in the, at a party, he might say them twice. Okay. So, so and a pr practice is, is important because it also reinforces the memory. You know, I, I there was a great story. Um, I it wasn't Mark Spitz, but the other great swimmer, Olympic swimmer, uh, uh, still you know, alive, still young today. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I know I, who. I, I, Mark, I, yeah. Well, anyway, <laughs> his, his trainer had this sequence where he would let him in the water, and as long as he practiced perfectly, he could continue swimming. The minute the trainer found anything that deviated from the correct form, he pulled them out of the pool. Mm. And his reasoning was, if you practice, you need to practice perfectly. Because okay. if you don't, whatever defects that you're working on will now be part of that memory. Yeah. So, you know, will we'll all of these, we, we've got eight different strategies. Will these prevent every senior moment, you know, a, a parent has? Not necessarily, but it's going to significantly reduce the number of them yeah i like that a lot uh so let me go back and let's uh let me ask you my uh loss of a word here and there okay. that has crept in in the last year what can i get from that what is that telling me okay not very much okay um <laughs> let, let me um, you know very briefly give you the whole sequence of what goes on in in word formation and in retrieval. Mm -hmm. I want to say something to you right now. I'm thinking about certain ideas I want to express. In order to express them, I'm now going to have to retrieve a number of things. I need to figure out the words I want to use. I need to figure out how I'm going to combine those words. Once I have all of that, then I'm going to have to innervate the muscles in my face, and I think 160 of some or so, and tell them, okay, what you're going to have to do, th these are the words I want you to form. You've already memorized what to do in order to say each of these words. I want you to do that. And now I'm going to also uh, send a signal. I'm going to send you the signal that tells you which ones to do. Okay. Now, all of this happens in milliseconds. Mm -hmm. If there is any disruption, what can happen is, remember I gave you the example of the gears? Mm -hmm. Okay, It prevents that. So what happens when you can't remember a certain word? It's not that, that you have forgotten the word, but your brain is having difficulty retrieving it. It's still yeah. there. The okay. question then becomes, what do you do to facilitate retrieval? Mm -hmm. uh, there are various strategies for that. You can visualize the word. You can try to think about the, the initial sound or the initial letter of the word. You can think about a lot of different things. And remember I said earlier about the domino effect? Mm -hmm. That You can do the same thing with that. Now, sometimes, you know, the, the memory of, of what you're trying to retrieve was so weak that it's not going to come back. Mm -hmm. But what you can then think about is, okay, what do I need to do to make it easier the next time that I have to retrieve a word? So you're, you're having a guest on and you're afraid you're going to forget his name. Mm -hmm. uh, so, Which is common. common okay. Common. So, so what, what, you know, so as you're, you're having the interview and you go to say, well, will doctor. Yeah. And, and you don't know what Done to it. do. 
Okay. The, the way that, that you deal with that is you start laying down memories before you actually need to do that. So the more you can say to yourself that name, layers are built up. You can talk, you can think about, about just the word itself. You can write it. You can use it in a sentence. You can make up a story. And every time you do one of these things, you're building another layer. Okay. That and the likelihood and the likelihood of forgetting it is significantly reduced. Especially if you write it. For me, I'm speaking, yeah. you know, from my own experience. Uh, when I was in college, uh, taking those notes was incredibly important. I'm I'm a online marketer and a graphic designer, and so I'm sure that has something to do with it. But when I would take that test, I would see mm -hmm. the actual written words on my, on the piece of paper mm -hmm. because I, yeah. because I wrote it. it was a matter yeah. of uh, so. Anyways, for me, that works a great deal. Let me ask you this: back to me again. Um, so I always had a bad memory my entire life. And my mother, she used to always be like, well, if it was more important to you, you'd remember it. She'd say that my entire life, just dog me on that. We're older now. And, uh, her and I, we have a terrific relationship and we we're talking about this, yeah, maybe a couple of years ago. And I was telling her how, uh, and she was talking about her memory, always being so bad. She always had a bad memory. I'm like, What? I got, that. she goes, you got your memory for me. I'm like, are you kidding me? I said, I got Lisa dogging me my entire adult life saying, well, if it was more important to you, you'd remember, but you're telling, you're finally telling me that we, I inherited this bad memory my entire life and you dogged me for it when I was a kid. She goes, well, that's what moms do. And uh, so it's just a funny story. Here's the question. I, like my mother, just was born with a bad memory Mm -hmm. Does that say anything about the possibility of Alzheimer's creeping in? No, not necessarily. But, but first, let's go back. Your mother was right, as mothers <laughs> usually right. are. Please don't watch this podcast, <laughs> Mom. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, if, if you think about, about what memories you have, they, well, let's back up first. How a memory is formed. When, when you're storing a memory, you know, it's, now this is theoretical. I mean, because no one really knows, even, even when they take the brain apart, they can't figure this out. Mm -hmm. But they think what happens is when you store a memory, it is broken apart into different pieces. Mm -hmm. So smell goes one way, vision goes another, you know, sound somewhere else, texture. And then when you are asked to retrieve that memory, all of these elements come back together. So if if they are skeleton like when you put them in there nice. you're going to have less to pull them out with so, so think about th think, think about a memory that you've had that is so strong what you know what are you remembering you're remembering probably the smell of something mm -hmm. the sensation how you felt mm -hmm. all of those things that we, we say well that's that's because it was important to you yeah but it doesn't have to be just important. You can make a determination to focus in on everything that's going on. What, what research has shown is that the more multidimensional something is, the easier it's going to be to be retrieved. And the so, I mean, people might say, well, that, that that's a term for being important or not important. Not necessarily. It may not be important for me you know, to uh, to look to see what's going on outside my house. But if I want to have a better idea of, of who's going to try to come in and rob me, then I'm going to look around a little bit more carefully. Mm -hmm. So so that that's what you can do. Whether Alzheimer's is inherited or dementia is inherited, I think, you know, that's up in the air with, with a lot of the issues. So mm -hmm. that I don't have an opinion with. But okay. I do know is that even in cases where dementia is expected the memories of those people can be improved wow. and and not necessarily through you know a uh an online program that that prepares to do that but rather thinking about a different lifestyle you know there's been a lot of research that looks at the role of sleep in memory mm -hmm. and and yeah. what happens you know with when when you don't sleep sufficiently enough which I'm the best case of that. I don't. 
uh, but also nutrition. You know, very few people know that the brain needs water just as muscles need water. You know, uh, the brain, I think, I forgot the, the, the figures, but essentially you need to hydrate your brain in order for it to function well. That's so, you know, good may, maybe maybe an older person is not getting enough water. Maybe their their food is consisting of more red meats than plant-based diets. You know, it could be all of these different things. So things can be done. And, you know, I, I think that what happens now in the medical community is that we wait until someone has an illness or shows signs of uh, or size symptoms before we interact and we interact. And again, my, my, my physician friends are going to be angry with this, but we interact after the disease has occurred rather than trying to prevent its occurrence. Yeah. It's you know, really good advice. There, there, there are wonderful medicines that are mm -hmm. around that can help people with Alzheimer's. But doesn't it make sense to prevent it in the first place? That's not the way we operate in this country. And it drives no. me crazy. Yeah. Okay. Um, I want to, I want to go back and I, I took something as you were explaining, I was thinking about my own bad memory. And one of the most embarrassing things for me that I really don't like about myself is my inability to remember names and faces. And so I'm putting together, I just want to share this with the audience mm -hmm. that I was putting together as you were explaining it, that uh, how you have to take in more details in order to make that memory. So I think what I need to do, probably should do, is really like look at their nose and and really yeah. think about, well, what is their nose like or whose is it like? Is it bigger? Mm -hmm. Is it smaller? Is it, does it have a lot of character? What about their eyes? What about their chin? What about their hair? And uh, I've, I, it's probably the faces thing I'm even worse at than names, because I know mm -hmm. the tricks about word association with names, and that can work for me. But boy, I could, I could go right up to somebody I met a week ago, and it happens all the time, and not remember that face. I find that very embarrassing. But I do believe that I can get better at it from what we just discussed. Yeah. Uh, I, here's an alternative suggestion. Although all of those things work, uh, what I found works even better is to put it in the form of a story. Mm, tell me. Do, do, do well, okay. Um, let, let let's use me as an example right now. You know, you're going to try to remember my name later on in the interview, or the, you know, tomorrow or the next day. I find well, your name easy though. Stan okay. Goldberg <laughs> rolls right off the tongue. <laughs> but but let's let's say it did. Okay. okay. Uh, I think, okay, well, it looks like this guy has hair like Harpo Marx. Hmm. Um, and, I, and so, you know, with, with the big flowery hair and, and the harp. So you could make up a story about me moving my hands as if I was playing the harp, you know, and instead of being totally quiet, I can't stop talking. Okay. So now, now you have a short little story. Yeah, I like it. The likelihood of remembering my name once you've created that story is significantly greater than just trying to say, what was that guy's name? Yeah, I totally get that. I totally get that. No, I, I appreciate that. Let's go back. I, I have some real world questions for you once again, that um, getting back to family and friends. Uh, so let's say that well, first of all, I love the idea of retirement communities because you have people watching over each other. You can have, I'm thinking of my mother-in-law. She lives in a small retirement community as walking around, around it one night late. And I was really taking it in and thinking about it. And Lisa and I have been talking about developing our own retirement community based on the fact that you have your autonomy, and yet you have people around you that were, all are looking out for each other, very, very close by. And uh, so I love that idea. That could possibly, that could get a lot of people uh, avoiding assisted living who happen to die peacefully in their sleep or by whatever Never. means while they live, they're living in this uh, relatively safe, safe place. Um, but so I think in my mind, what are the next steps? What if this person holds on into their 90s, but mm -hmm. now they cannot take care of themselves as well as they could? My God, they still want their auto autonomy until the day they die. 
it seems to be that the next step would be to bring somebody in a few times a week to take them shopping, do dishes, help clean up for a few hours a day. Do you, and maybe that prevents the need for assisted living, which I see as a last resort. Do you agree with me? This is just me talking, just thinking it through. Well, I, I think it's more complicated than agreeing or not agreeing. Okay. Um, let me tell you what I consider to be the ideal setting that I've heard of. This was a friend of mine who has early Alzheimer's. Again, this is another person uh, lives in Europe. And they have things called dementia communities. So sure. you have a whole village filled with, with people that, that have dementia. And those who are going to serve them, let's say in the restaurant or in the store, know about dementia. So they are sensitive to their needs. Uh, you know, to me, that was like, if if I have dementia, that's where I want to go. No, I totally get it. Yeah. But I, I don't know if you have that here in mm -hmm. the States. Mm. One of the problems I have with retirement communities is that everybody's the same age. Or they're they're, yeah. they're all older. And yeah. and that's fine. That that's that's terrific for feeling some compatibility. But going back to the research that I looked at on, on cognition, what I think is also important is to have younger people there who are stimulating, who can mm. talk about different issues. You know, it doesn't have to come from that, but I think that that definitely works. Um, I've had, you know, I've had my own uh, relatives who needed assisted living mm. and some, you know, found it wonderful. Others didn't. Uh, I would would prefer all things being equal. I would prefer to have to stay in my own house if mm -hmm. I develop dementia right. and have people come in to assist. But in all honesty, you know, it's getting hard to find qualified people who are sensitive to the needs of people that are having cognitive problems who are coming into their home. Yeah. So it's it's not a a yes or no. It's let's work toward an ideal. Yeah, I, that's really good feedback. I never had given thought to that about the dementia communities, but that makes a lot of good sense. Uh, let's see where I had. a. Oh, this is where I wanted to go next. Here's a tough one. Same kind of scenario. When do you take the car keys away and how do you do it? <laughs> well, let me give you um, a real life example. Okay. Uh, my brother-in-law had brain cancer and uh, my wife and I live out in the West coast. He lived on the East coast and we were told that he was still driving his car mm. um, when his ability to perceive what was happening was uh, severely impacted. The last time being that he tried driving in reverse you know, out of the parking lot onto the street. Yeah. And he wanted to maintain his independence, mm -hmm, refused to give up his keys. Mm -hmm. And we needed to think that that would make it easier. Mm -hmm. So the first was, was, you know, we appealed to his feelings of compassion towards other people. And we tried to convince him that uh, if he continued driving, he was going to kill somebody. Mm -hmm. And that person, you know, could be a young person, could be a family person, but he was going to hurt somebody. And now that almost worked. We thought this, this is great. We, we have the solution, but it didn't. The second, so then we, we became more aggressive. We basically took the keys away. We didn't ask anybody. We just mm. took them away. Now that worked to prevent him from driving, but he became desolate. Or because oh, you know th this this was something that he loved to do so what we did was we hired a driver someone who could drive him on demand uh and, and we call we, that uber over here not, now it's uber there was no <laughs> uber this was this was okay. over 10 years ago okay and so uh that definitely helped until he got to the point where he knew he couldn't drive and, and his cognition had deteriorated to a point where it wasn't an issue. But I, I think that in terms of a strategy, I think the person's rationality 
I, I'm sorry, it, Stan. A couple of words just skipped okay. out because of the, Zoom. The first thing I would do is to appeal to their rationality. Mm -hmm. If that doesn't work, appeal to their humanity. Mm -hmm. If that doesn't work, then you just take the keys away. <laughs> okay. I yeah. am worried about I'm worried about a bad accident. Um, yeah. I think we all understand the situation. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, I've been just free forming it here, but I had all kinds of questions for you written down. So let's uh, let me see. I did the uh, forgetting words. I'm glad to know I'm not going crazy. It's not necessarily. <laughs> and yes. your mother was, and your mother was right. Remember that one? <laughs> yeah, of course, of course. Oh, six myths to the popular belief that senior moments well, are an inevitable and unchangeable part of aging what are these six myths yeah i think inevitable? yeah the, the the first one let me just take a quick look because with my age i forget as well <laughs> um see mom yeah <laughs> even the doctor yeah <laughs> but but not the type that helps people uh so the, <laughs> the, the, the first one is that that they're momentary brain, brain glitches that are confined to seniors. We kind of talked about that. Yeah. That, that they are not momentary. They're caused by something. And there's no starting point for, for that. Uh, the second one is that they, be, they can be lumped together. There's actually nine different types of, of senior moments, ranging from forgetting, you know, words to being disoriented and everything in between. Mm -hmm. And each of them has different causes. Mm -hmm. So if you can identify the type of uh, senior moment you're having, you can probably figure out how to correct that. Uh, the well, you know, I want to reiterate, because I thought this was super important and really yeah. gave me a whole new understanding. What you said a while ago about when you are thinking and trying to assess if somebody is getting Alzheimer's or whatever, because they're repeating themselves or being uh, have a disorienting moment, take into account everything that has go been going on in their life in that recent history. How many mm -hmm. distractions are Correct. there? How many new things are? I just wanted mm -hmm. to repeat that because it was really eye-opening yeah. to me. Okay. Uh, the next one is, the third is that senior moments are solely the result of memory problems. They're not. Uh, they are, if, if we think about senior moments as resulting from problems in learning, then there are certain things that don't rely on, on memory. So th they're more than just a memory issue. The fourth is that they're an inevitable part of aging. That's not true. There are many people, you know, into their 90s that don't have any senior moments. Uh, the fifth is that they shouldn't be more concerning than a good laugh. You know, not all of these are appropriate for a, a late night comedy show. Mm -hmm. uh, there are some that we shouldn't laugh at. What there's some that we should. Uh, the sixth is that they're isolated events that do, that do not define who you are. This is an interesting one because they are defining. A lot of times we want to say, well, that's just you know he's having a senior moment, but quite often it does affect their identity and and that can be a great cause for consternation for the person who experiences it um the last one is that they can be limited through motivation now all you need to do is is remember that you told a story you know, no that has nothing to do with it so those are those are the myths and i think the the fewer myths that people uh, tell themselves or tell their relatives, mm -hmm. the easier it will be to get rid of senior moments. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, can we predict our future cognitive ability by the senior moments that we are experiencing today? Great question. I think so. I don't think there's been uh, enough study done to definitively say that. Mm -hmm. However, what, what I found is, is the following. When you start having a, a certain type of learning problem, and let's say in your 40s, and, you're not, and you don't do anything to correct that, the likelihood of that learning problem will continue is greater. Mm. And as you get older and more variables are involved in making your life more difficult, 
the greater the possibility that learning is problem will not only persist, but get worse. Mm. So the qualified answer is, it seems reasonable to me that if you're having a specific cognitive or learning problem today, and you don't do anything about mm. it, that's the kicker. If you don't do anything about it, you're going to probably have that later on and it'll be worse. Wow. I didn't expect you to answer it that way. I th <laughs> I thought you, were... you, you thought I'd be rosy. You'd give you something yeah, I, I did. I did. No, but I really, really appreciate that you said, yeah. and you don't do anything about it. So that's yeah. kind of, you know, how is it said today? And Lisa says this all the time, my partner. She's like, uh, when it comes to the healthcare industry, you have to take agency for your own health. And, uh, because uh, otherwise you don't get that good of care. You got to really be on them. And I think the same applies right here to what you just said is uh, you, you owe it to yourself to take responsibility for trying to improve on if you notice these senior moments. So mm -hmm. yeah. I do have a final question, but I want to continue with this line of thought that we're talking about because um, pulling this all together. So a few things that quite a few things that I've picked up from you during this conversation about what we can do one drink more water we need mm -hmm. our brains need to be hydrated nutritionally virtually all of us could do a little bit better and most of us kid each other we talk a lot on this show about but sugar about sugar and all the various forms of these uh this processed sugar that is in processed foods and uh processed foods in general uh, you got to really look at that stuff, folks. If you can't pronounce the words and the ingredients, try to improve on that. I have no doubt that that will affect your senior moments, uh, all of the processed uh, chemicals in these foods. Oh, uh, let's see what else. I know we didn't talk about this, but I, know I got this from Jordan Peterson, who I have a great deal of respect for. He said, by far and away, the best thing you can do for uh, your cognitive abilities is physical exercise. Now that, you know, that's a, that's a good one. We all, yeah. we need to get our blood flowing and we need mm -hmm. to breathe. We need to breathe heavy. So that's another good one. Uh, let's see, what are some other really good uh, things that you put out there? Uh, developing patterns so that you can uh, not forget your keys or, or your phone or, or your wallet let's say. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and uh, I'm just going right off the top of my head. Other things we could do are, I don't know if I want to say word association, but increase your perception. This is what I'm taking for myself when I'm trying to remember faces is I'm going to look more at the details of faces and maybe try to say, who do they look like to me? Mm -hmm. It's something like word association for names. Um, if there's anything else that you can think of that uh, just for us viewers here. Well, when, when I, you know, I was a practicing speech language pathologist for 25 years. And uh, I was very big on developing strategies for my clients to use to do new behaviors. So sometimes, you know, like, for example, in the area of stuttering, I might have 10 different strategies that they could use. And I, and I got the same question continually. Well, which ones are most important? Which one should I absolutely do? And I forgot the one about slowing down. Yeah. My, 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 moment, my, yeah. Yeah, my, my response was, here's something to think about. And it's true for any time you're trying to change something through strategies, the more, the better the fewer, the less possible you're going to succeed. Yeah. So, I mean, I, I think all of these are important. Uh, Sanjay Gupta wrote a great book on, on uh, the, the effects of various kinds of nutrients. Uh, again, as I said, I'm not a real doctor, so I can't uh, endorse any of those things. Exercise is important, whether that's the most important thing in preventing senior moments. I haven't seen any research. And, and I, I like to depend on research. Mm -hmm. So if, if, this, if, something doesn't, if something doesn't say this shows unequivocally that this is the best thing you can do, then I'm going back to the advice I gave 25 years ago. The more, the better. Mm. No, that, I think that's a really good answer. Yeah. All right. I got a really important question for you. And I don't, I don't know the answer to it. When 
it's back to the housing thing and taking the car keys away and assistance and this kind of thing. So it comes down to, we need to put mom in a home and I'm not, and this is fictitious. All right. So don't panic anyone. Uh, Especially it, mom. <laughs> right. So it comes down to, uh, we really need assistance that uh, okay. it's for sure. What is the difference between assisted living in a nursing home? Is it the same? You know, I, I think it varies. I mean, to me, I, mean, I when I was still at the university, I would place my students in both kinds of facilities. Um, I found, and again, things have changed because I haven't been back there for a while, mm -hmm. but nursing homes tend to be, this is my experience, sort of expanded homes that have qualified or unqualified people caring. Assisted living homes are facilities that have qualified and unqualified people who are caring. It almost doesn't make a difference what we're going to call it. Uh -huh. What's important is what's going on there. Mm -hmm. I've been in assisted living homes that were exorbitantly expensive. Yes. Where, where the, where the uh, interactions between patients and personnel was limited to feeding and changing them. I've been in nursing homes where the people who were being cared for were part of the family. So I wouldn't be too concerned about what we call it. I would want to spend some time there and see how the personnel interact with the patients. That's a good, that's, that's good feedback. I would also, just because of today's day and age, I would also encourage people that if you are looking into this kind of thing, go online and look up reviews. That's the most mm -hmm. important thing to happen really in the last 10 to 15 years, as far as yeah. online goes, is that uh, people that are doing nefarious things out there will get outed online. So go straight and look at the bad reviews first. Yeah, uh, I, I, I would agree with you on that. But I think even more important is if you're considering a facility, ask them if you could spend a couple hours there yeah, or I a whole day good. there. Yeah. And you can see what's going on. Okay. With that, uh, you ready to wrap up, Stan? I think so. All right. So I want to mention again that your website is stangoldbergwriter.com. And Goldberg is G-O-L-D-B-E-R-G. Uh, stangoldbergwriter.com. I will put the link to his book and, and other books in uh, on Amazon in the show notes. But you could also get it straight at uh, stangoldbergwriter.com. Do you have any other closing uh, remarks or links yeah. or anything? I recently started writing for Psychology Today. Nice. Uh, and so a lot of the issues that we discussed today, I include them in the articles that I write. I usually do two a month for them. Uh, I also just finished a novel that will uh, hopefully tap into many of the things we talked about today and some of my other books. And I've done that since I find that some people still find these topics a little difficult mm -hmm. and it's much easier when they read about them in the form of a story. Well, maybe we could have you back on to talk about that. that I'd sounds, love to. <laughs> yeah, that sounds terrific. I absolutely love talking with you. You answered a lot of questions that my friends and I didn't have the answers to. And you're right. These are some tough conversations. So yeah. I really appreciate that. It was and, my pleasure being here. Well, thank you very much. I'll email you, let you know where to find this episode. Hopefully it'll come out this afternoon. Great. All right, Stan. Again, love, thank you so much. Love talking to you. All right. You as well. Have a good weekend. You too. Bye-bye.